Yeah, like I said, we're doing chapter four today, um, uh, special considerations, right? So last week we talked about um, kind of the overarching, uh, you know, what is data science? What is education? And, you know, both of those huge topics. And then we're trying to put them together, right? And talk, talked a little bit through that. Um, and so now today is really digging into, um, uh, you know, the, some, of the, some of the realities of re really when we're applying data science to education. Um, but before we get started, um, just a couple announcements. One is uh, we'd encourage you to sign up for leading out a discussion uh, via the GitHub README file. Um, and I, I'm happy to walk through that um, after this, because it is a shorter chapter. So I'm happy to walk through it again. Um, there's also uh, several help videos that are on the GitHub, um, our GitHub page, which is, uh, it's uh, book club dash D-S-I-E-U-R in the R4DS GitHub account. Um, and so, and then we also, second, second uh, announcement is that we're combining chapters five and six. Um, uh, Isabella posted something on Slack yesterday or this morning, I don't know, time is weird. Um, and we're gonna combine five and six. So five is very, some of the basic things, you know, installing and loading R and R Studio, um, making sure you understand, you know, how to do some very, very basic things. Um, and we'd encourage you, if you do need to get up to speed to review that on your own. Um, and then we're gonna focus more on chapter six. So I think Mark just said that he was uh, uh, signing up for next week. So, hey, Mark, can you, can you focus on chapter six? Um, um, but if you do need help with some of the chapter five things, that next week also, I think it will be a fine time for you to make sure you're up to speed. We're all, we're all in this together, so. Um, cool. I also noticed on Slack, there are a couple new people and I see a couple new faces. Um, so I would love to just do introductions again. Um, so just some brief introductions, uh, your name, where you're working, um, and, and some basic what you do. Uh, so you know, I'll start, I'm Ryan Woodbury. Um, I work at the Institute for Educational Initiatives at Notre Dame. And um, I'm a program evaluator where we offer a dozen or so programs focused mostly on Catholic education um, in, for teacher training on a number of different topics, anywhere from getting their master's degree in education to teach or um, certification programs for ENL or inclusive education or things like that. So, I've, and I've been doing that for about three years. Go ahead. I'm happy to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Isabella Velasquez. I am a data analyst at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation been there for a little bit more than four years. And um, at the foundation, we uh, primarily work with either publicly available education data, um, such as like big federal data sets, um, and then also data gathered from our wonderful grantees and partners. Um, so really nice to be here. Oh, and I am one of the co-authors of the book. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that, uh, along with Four other fantastic co-authors. Um, really excited to have um, hear like these discussions and hear how people have been engaging with the book as well. Hi, I'm Morgan Grovenberg. I'm uh, the retention specialist at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma. Um, my job is all about student success. Uh, I mostly deal with um, identifying uh, risk factors for our students um, and developing uh, interventions to uh, retain those students so that they complete their degree. I can't tell um, because the screen's being shared. I can't see anybody else's faces, so I can't see if anybody else is about to speak. Um, I'm Catherine Miller. I am, um, oh, that's better, thank you. Um, 
Um, my name is Catherine Miller. I work as a, a college reading instructor, and also I work for um, a group called Early Intel. We work with Head Start agencies around quality improvement, um, and uh, we help them generate um, tools to help them collect data that they can use to to make system level changes to their programs. Uh, my name is Edgar Zamora. I'm a research analyst in the institutional research department at Big Bend Community College, and I uh, we work with institutional data to kind of uh, show retention, show you know things that we can do to improve student success and help them as you make their way through college. I'm Rob. I'm an instructional designer at UNC. Um, formerly an educational researcher, but more the qualitative type, so kind of new to the uh, quantitative end of things. Here. I'll go. I'm Mark Lavania. I'm data strategist at Ed Reports. We review K-12 curriculum for standards alignment, usability. Um, my work largely informs around you know, curating um, data for to inform our strategy work. Um, also to to uh, to track goals to see if we're, you know, measure impact and, and so forth. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Yuki Toyama. Um, I am at UC Berkeley um, Assessment and Evaluation Research Center. I have worked long um, in educational research, uh, doing a lot more to do with program evaluations. Um, and both qualitative and quantitative research, but um, my PhD training at Berkeley focused on quantitative um, methodologies and especially psychometrics. And uh, Catherine and I are friends, we share the same uh, advisor. Great, thank you. I, I, think, I think that was everyone. Did everyone go? Okay. okay. Um, I've got to find the right window. I think this is the one. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Um, now, I wanted to try something. Um, and I would love to hear, I know we just we just introduced ourselves and talked a little bit about just generally what we do. But if you'd like to share, I'll, we'll have a few moments, um, just like a highlight from work. What, do you, what did you love doing the past, you know, it doesn't even have to be within the past week, just what have you loved doing the past year or some, or it could be something small, you know, just today. Um, I love to hear what people are doing and what, what you find joy in with your work. Um, well, with data related work, I enjoyed. So um, my, my daughter went to a charter school in San Francisco. And it's just an independent small, just one organization. So they didn't have anybody who could uh, analyze SDAC, you know, state standardized test data. And so I volunteered and looked at the data and the principals and teachers um, had this stereotyped image, you know, issues related to the equity, the low achievement is associated with uh, non-white students. And that's true, but I was able to show them uh, within each race category, there is huge variability. And being able to show that and then just not like blanket way um, attribu attributing low achievement or achievement gap just between race categories, I thought that was uh, meaningful for me. And that's why I get excited about using R um, to visualize data so that you can tell stories, more nuances, and so forth. So that's what I get excited about using R and communicate what may be hidden <laughs> in the data, through the data. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I like about my work with Early Intel is um, we work with Head Start agencies all over the country, and many times they bring us problems like you know system level problems that seem intractable. And um, working with them, like 
having these meetings with them and getting them to get all the users in one spot to talk about um, the problems that they're having and their different viewpoints on it. Um, I've seen I've seen so much energy come out of those meetings where it goes from at the beginning of the year, like frustration and confusion to this kind of slow empowerment um, of the groups themselves where they start to take ownership about of what they're doing, um, especially around data. So that's why this work is interesting, like working, learning how to use R more proficiently, more proficiently, I think will um, help me let them see what they're doing. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share? Yeah. Well, mine won't be um, exactly data related, but it's just been really gratifying over the last year. My group is supporting the design of online courses and it's been a big year for, um, for online course delivery, obviously with a lot of people, uh, students and teachers in situations that they, they haven't been in before. And it's been frustrating for a lot of people, but also really gratifying for us to be able to help people with those um, with those situations, and so I'm coming coming to the the data angle because I'm trying to find ways of of better using data about student performance in learning management systems to further enhance uh, our capacity to to teach online. Thank and you. especially something at work uh, for me was. Uh, creating a better workflow to kind of, you know, speed up some of these uh, processes. And so like transitioning from using multiple data sources and multiple, you know, different connections to using just one more streamlined process that, you know, avoids kind of doing repetitive work and uh, just making it more streamlined so we can be more efficient in our, in our work with, with data. I think mine is similar to Edgar's um, in that uh, I, I work closely with the knowledge management specialist uh, on our, on our um, organization. And we're always trying to figure out sort of systems level work, like, you know, as far as like archiving and sharing information and getting people the information they need in a timely fashion. And so a lot of that efficiency and workflow aspect comes in and, and that's figuring out how to do that well um, and, uh, and working with across the organization to figure that out is, is a highlight of my work. Um, something I really love about my job is um, communicating the results, you know, uh, running the analysis, but then communicating the results and actually, you know, <laughs> the, the persuasion part of convincing uh, that we need to turn this data into action, you know, the, the insights that we gain and then what we should do with it. Um, and it's exciting to see um, when other people uh, get excited about it and, you know, are, are uh, make the, you know, make changes based on um, a conversation that I have with them. Yeah, just to share a highlight from actually just this week, uh, somebody asked for a particular data point on um, on a subject, and they were like, "But surely, like that data doesn't exist, really, right? Like we don't have that, but we did." And it's just like it was so. Um, well, it was a bit gratifying, but also it, it felt really nice to like know, you know, all the work around the conversations about the data that people need and building the infrastructure around it to actually be able to, you know, provide um, people the results that they are asking for. It was, um, it, it was quite nice. <laughs> uh, this, thank you. I, I, I'm glad that everyone had a, something to share. Um, um, something that I've been really enjoying um, is is kind of data related. I'm I've been leading out a what we call a data team, um, where stakeholders throughout our this particular organization um, that I work for. So there's like 15 of us are all trying to identify um, ways in which we can create a better data culture um, and 
our, our, our mission is to collaborate, streamline, and support. Um, and we've just started out. And so it's a, it's a long road ahead, but I'm really excited that I think we're kind of all in the same, uh, or we have similar um, highlights where we really enjoy the streamlining of things, efficiency of things, but then really getting things to change um, and, and providing an impact with our work I, um, and it's, it's not just data work, right? It's actual providing some impact, which actually you guys played right into my hands because um, this is what, right? Chapter four was about, was like dealing with people, dealing with reality. Data science is not just data work, um, but it's, I, I'm gonna argue, and I think I'd love a discussion about um, these special considerations in chapter four really was helping us think about change management inside of, our organizations and the realm of education. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, how many different audiences or stakeholders do you deal with typically in a, in a, in a kind of your average project? <clears throat> do you want us to respond in the chat or do you want us to speak? Either, yeah, that's, a, yeah, we can do chat or we can, yeah, we can respond verbally either way. Um, let me know if I understood your question correctly. Um, I know for me, um, every other week, I'm part of a retention committee that has um, administrators and faculty um, across campus. And we're a group of, I'm not sure, let's see, 24, <laughs> 24 of us on the retention committee. Um, so I, I'm part of that. I, I'm housed uh, with advising. So a, a lot of my work is uh, with the advisors as well. Um, um, but uh, today I, I led my first webinar uh, that was an invitation to all faculty at our institution. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's my hope is uh, hopefully I will be interacting with everyone. <laughs> but you didn't share that as a highlight. Did it go okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was, I was pretty nervous. Uh, sure. I, I'm doing the same, the same one on Friday. So I, it went, it went all right. I, no, no complaints. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, uh, I guess I'm like audience groups maybe is, would be a, a way to put it. So it sounds like you're dealing at least with, you know, a couple every other week um, and then interacting, you know, with, with more and other things. Um, and the chat seems to be settling on about five. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a, just a multitude of different audiences at different levels with different levels of expertise when it comes to, um, you know, data related things or people are, are, um, you know, they want to use data. Ideally, they'd like to use, some, you know, what you're offering them, um, but they may not understand it in certain ways. And so part of our job, right, especially that later part of the data science process is to communicate. And, and I, we could, I think there's a lot of things that we could add to that process, like navigating systems and <laughs> figuring out the politics of, you know, our organization or, you know, uh, a state or a nation or whatever. Um, and so, um, and then dealing with, like, yeah, like I said, social or cultural or political systems, but also just the technology that we have to deal with and accessing the data. Um, so I, I've, I've, um, added this book here called Switch. Um, I don't know if you've read it. Um, and then also this uh, site here from ProSci, which they talk about the ad car model of change management. Um, and I'm, it's interesting. So ad car, I'm trying to remember what it is. Um, and I'm blanking on it, but, um, but basically you want to bring 
people through s- s- stages of change, um, making sure that they're aware of it, that they have the knowledge of you know what they can do, um, and uh, yeah, you, then you're getting them to to act and engage in in, in a change. Um, <clears throat> and switch is is you know written by some Stanford researchers um, where they try to simplify change, all changes, behavioral change, um, and um, uh, going through some, some uh, steps of how you can shrink, shrink the change so it helps people change or um, engaging their rational and emotional parts of, of their uh, thinking. So um, your... Uh, Let's see. Sorry, I'm looking over the chat here. <clears throat> Thinking in systems. I've never, I haven't heard of that one. Oh, it's really good book. It's, it um, by Danella Meadows. It's mm-hmm. like it's a pretty good book on system thinking, and it it helps as a like basic understanding about how things work. Really. Well written. Awesome. I, I'll have to, I'll have to check that one out. <clears throat> um, so right. So this is a framework that we can, we can consider for this week. Is that we're we're partly amongst all of our other positions that we hold, you know, or hats that we wear. We have to deal with helping people change, right? <clears throat> um, so. Looking in data science, right? I have the obligatory Hadley Wickham uh, just typing R code, right? We have to, we have to deal with uh, things within data science, right? We've got to learn to code. And um, like uh, Hadley Wickham has spoken on before, the best thing to do to learn is to, to do it. And um, his team, at, he and, and his awesome team at our studio have tried to provide tools for you so that you can fall into the pit of success, right? Um, I think he's talked about that before, um, where you are just practicing and, and, and doing, you know, practicing code, doing code. Um, uh, and I hope that as we get into R, right, we're going to start next week in, in R, and as we do the walkthroughs, that we can have that place um, here where we can just be coding. Um, even if it's copy and pasting, that's still a, a great way to learn. Um, there was another uh, point uh, in the book where we're addressing ambiguity um, and this idea of reproducibility. Um, and I have, let's see. I have actually, I'm gonna, we're gonna jump here. So I have a, a, a mentee survey. Please be patient with me. This is my first mentee. So let's see how this goes. Um, so if you go to mentee.com, type in that code, something should come up, I hope. Um, and uh, these are the questions just to prepare you. I wanna, I wanna get a sense of how you engage with your um, reproducible research. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that it's probably better for me to share that presentation, right? Somebody who is a mentee professional. Yeah. It, sure. Yeah. Right. Your mentee meter URL should be good. There. <laughs> Yes, uh, Catherine, I was, there's been a, Isabella used Menti and Rob used some other uh, software and I was, I was just jealous. So I had to use this interactive uh, survey tool, uh, which Menti is one of them, or Mentimeter is one of them. <clears throat> I guess, I think that's everyone, right? Because there's seven of Okay, so we're uh, relatively, I mean, I know these are arbitrary cutoffs, but um, we're relatively uh, a younger 
group when it comes to our particular job that we're in right now. Um, and then I, I'm curious about, how do I advance to the next slide? What happens when you click? Or arrow? Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your patience. So now I'm curious to see how you would rate your reproducibility when you started your position the at its current um, state and then what your ideal state of reproducibility would be. So the, the end markers are, it's a manual labor intensive undocumented um, clunky mess um, or it's automatic, which is a star, uh, meaning it's as automatic as it can be, um, well-documented. Your data dictionaries have data dictionaries. Like that's like where, where this is at, right? <clears throat> and I believe these are just the averages of other people. Okay. Great, I think that's everyone. Well, um, first off, congratulations to everyone. You've, on average, increased your reproducibility by you know a couple points. I know that the midpoints are, um, you know, it's it's not a ratio, uh, <laughs> a scale, but um, uh, yeah, congratulations, everyone, on on your work. And I know that many of you are early, you know, early in your job. So this is awesome. Um, pat yourself on the back. And it looks like though we've got ideally <laughs> quite a bit of work to to go. Uh, to get it up to that eight uh, points on average. Um, and uh, let's see here, I'm gonna close this one. <clears throat> Great, um, so uh, going back to, this one. So how, how have you seen that, you know, that change, you know, uh, using that scale those that change from, you know, one, one and a half to, you know, almost three. Um, how have you, have you seen that change improve your workflow as well as, or, and your work as well as those that you impact? Have you seen kind of this feed, given any feedback, you know, what have you seen in addressing ambiguity through, through, um, increasing reproduce, reproducibility. So for me specifically, so my boss, when I first came into the position, she really relied on like access and Excel and she would like put notes and do calculations in like the Excel sheets. So that was really hard for me to like quite understand. So like, I spent most of my time trying to re, you know, try to get, figure out how did she even come to these numbers. And so, you know, something that I think is simple and easy is just like, if you're on PC, you can do a README and a notepad. And I think that's, a, it. That's I think we first started off by just putting a notepad in there and saying, you know, this is the query and this is like just the steps like that. So I think avoiding having to start all over again, I think is something, you know, will really go a long way is just pointing you in the right direction. And like, as we transitioned into R and stuff, I think, you know, again, read me files, but also commenting a lot. Um, it's just, I think, and I, I try to avoid spending as much time as I can trying to figure out what I wrote and actually doing the analysis. And I think at its base level read me file, many sorts can help you a long way in reproducibility. I feel like I had a similar experience when I first started. Um, like there's no mandated language or anything, but I used R and my coworkers used 
um, Theta or they didn't use any programming language. And I think, um, you know, we were asked to do very similar things repeatedly and like having to restart all over, you know, it's just like a big drain of time and, and um, energy. And I think like, um, and my coworkers like seeing R and how it worked, like actually prompted them to start learning R. And so now, and then we became like a big team of R users um, that could like share code and, and like work with each other to like, um, to make sure like we could reproduce each other's things. So like, there was no worry, like if somebody went on a vacation that like all the work uh, assigned to them had to stop because of that. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was a, I, I think like, yeah, just being able to like ex offer an alternative that showcases like how, how it benefits the work. Thank you. Um, yeah, Edgar, I was, I was joking with somebody, I think it was yesterday, like I have forgotten how to use Excel um, just because and I know, I know it's still used. I know it's, I, I also have talked to another friend of mine who, you know, some big company still uses Excel to make decisions and that's fine. Right. That's, that's great. Um, but for, if I was given like, Hey, can you help us build something in Excel? I'd be like, Sorry. <laughs> um, I've lost all any skill that I did have. Um, but yeah, you know, so right. R, R among other languages helps us produce um, repeatable analyses um, for a number of, you know, impactful reasons. <clears throat> um, skip ahead there. So I know this slide has a lot, but the, these are some of the specific um, considerations that data scientists can um, have when engaging in the education realm, right? We have, I think we've mentioned a few of them, these systemic organizational resistance, um, just the, the newness of data science and education. I know there's been flavors of it before, um, uh, for good or bad, right? Um, learning analytics or you know, standardized tests, you know, analyzing numbers there, but data science kind of proper um, is relatively new here in education. So there's just a lack of process and guidelines. Um, uh, you know, getting it into the hands of people who need it um, they may not have the training. We may give it to them, but they just may not know what to do with it. Um, and then, you know, good education is, is provides a, um, equitable education. Um, and so always considering that. Uh, and I loved, I, I love bringing this up with people I work with, like, you know, the complexity and the nestedness of, of educational data. Um, of course, of course, you know, ethical concerns and legal concerns, right, with especially K-12 education, along with, you know, other, other laws and things with older uh, higher ed. Um, and then having to deal with the type of analyses that we do and what's best practice within education um, may be slightly different than other um, fields. So um, so here, here are a couple um, uh, resources that I've, that, that I've personally read. There's thousands of others, no doubt. Um, but there's a book called Education Data Done Right, which um, I've, I've been reading in my free time, whenever that is. Um, and I've been, really been enjoying this book, um, talking about data governance and education. Um, yes, and, and the book is, is Thank you for that site. Uh, the book is um, relatively easy to access. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it talks about, you know, from this top-down idea of you need, you need a data governance thing and you need to get your stakeholders in on that. Um, and so it's talking about building that culture and stuff. And so it's been very helpful for me who has been trying to build out that culture. Um, so I'd recommend that if that's where you're at. Um, Kathy O'Neill has written a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, where she does have an example in education um, using a, a value-added model. Um, so making sure that, you know, she talks about what weapons of math destruction are and how that they could be quite detrimental to education. 
um, in, in that particular chapter. Um, and then I, I saw this on Twitter, this is back in August, I had to go look for it, but um, I'm sure several professors are teaching, um, you know, how we deal, you know, how administrators and school leaders can deal with some of the major issues that we've been dealing with, especially within this past year, um, you know, or that have been uh, further uh, illuminated by the events of this past year with uh, the pandemic and with the injustices of uh, racial injustices. So, um, so here's one, you know, syllabus that I found and likely there are many others. Um, and I know people here at Notre Dame who are doing similar, are attempting to do similar things. So just know that there are resources out there. Um, <clears throat> so before, yeah, I, I'd love to now, I'd love to hear about those resources that if you have any other resources, I know a couple of people have um, offered some in chat, but what, what resources do you have in addressing these things, one? And if specific, if you can be specific, you know, what advice or best practice have you found successful in dealing with some of these things? Well, I'll just jump in. Um, so one of the things that's interesting, so on uh, on our academic side, so we have a ELA group and a math group and a science group. And um, <clears throat> um, on the impact team that I'm on with uh, knowledge management, we work in between all them. And it's interesting how they all have sort of their, their preferred systems to use. And there's a lot of ways in which, you know, it's, it's beneficial if everyone's kind of using a common system, but, um, uh, nav navigating sort of the preference of, uh, of in sort of individuality and personality that forms in groups and trying to form some coherence um, is, is, is interesting. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly where you're going, but that's, that's a interesting systems level um, issue we work with. I think there's um, a webinar called We All Count. Um, it talks about, it's an introductory to data equity and it talks, I can put it in the chat, but it's about, you know, just considering ways in which we not only collect data, but also look at data and then present data. And that there are embedded biases within like the way data is collected to begin with. And it's just, it gets you thinking of, well, you know, what you presented with, there are, there's also, you know, there's background behind it that you kind of need to consider in order to, you know, get a holistic and you know, an equitable presentation of the data. Yeah, I don't have resource, but I, in relation to uh, complex nature of education data, Yes, there, there is nestedness, but the other aspect of that is what a lot of things that we care about is latent, and it's something that you can't observe directly. And so there's just a lot of work going on to you know, make sure your instrument or survey or assessment uh, is capturing what you are interested in, the latent variable, and what it means to create a variable is something that maybe we don't talk too much about like you know the data comes to you but I think we should have critical eye towards how that particular data is collected with a particular instrument um, and yeah just being yeah critical about all these biases and the validity and reliability issues as well and fairness. That's a really helpful note. Um, I, I also don't have a resource to suggest, but I, I just wanted to register that I found that section to be a little um, unsatisfying in the, in the book. I guess what's a book club without a little bit of disagreement maybe. So um, I, I mean, I appreciated that, that it was included, but it seemed like the extent of the message 
was mostly to do with transparency and that equity issues could be solved by transparency um, and that the primary source of, of equity problems would be unintended consequences that people might be making. But if we could just all get, you know, be more kind of thoughtful about our decision making that, you know, we would come to the right equitable decision, which doesn't, you know, agree with some things that, I don't know, <laughs> at least my perspective on, on these things is that people have different interests that they're pursuing and that, you know, um, there, there is conflict out there, not just, not just like failure to understand each other or, you know, accidental inequity or something like that. But it just seems a lot naughtier to me than something that can be solved just by, um, by increasing transparency. Uh, but I had a little bit of a hard time putting my finger on what else I wanted them to, um, to say about it. So I did feel like Kathy O'Neill's discussion of this was a lot thicker and meatier. And I looked back at that and she had some specific, she had like a specific principle that it's not just about opacity, um, but about whether the, uh, whether an algorithm like reinforces a social situation and starts a feedback loop. Um, so I thought that was one thing that makes something more specific. And I think Yuki's note there about um, like really interrogating uh, the source of the data and not just, I mean, it's so easy to black box data and take it as a, an uncomplicated representation of, of learning. Um, I, I'm, I'm coming from, you know, like a more social, social studies of, of data perspective, I guess, or something so I'm much more interested in looking at um, where it comes from and like, is it actually objective learning that administrators in our lives might want things to just be like completely um, objective numbers that they don't have to reflect on too much. But anyway, th so those those kind of things flesh it out a little bit more for me, but I am I continue to, um, to be hungry for uh, just some like thicker discussions of, of the equity issues here. I am. Um, I also don't really have a, a resource to, to offer, but I wanted to connect a little bit to what Rob was saying um, in, in the work that I've been doing with groups over the past several years. Um, I noticed that they want to work with data um, and they're a little constrained by the data that is, you know, they're, they're required to um, collect. And their, their um, analysis starts from this data that they have, um, they have compliance um, requirements around and it, it forces them into these ideas of like, like what's important um, that might not actually reflect the context that they're in and the issues that they have in front of them. But because it's a little bit of the wild west, um, they, they don't have a structure, These some of these sites that I work with, they don't have a structure to actually create the data that they need that would give them insight into what is going on, which is a, it's an, it's an equity issue, right? Whose interests are being represented, um, but it's also a lack of processes and guidelines, right? Um, we want, we want institutions to be responsive and proactive with their data, but um, many times, the people who work within the institutions that have the greatest insight into what's happening, um, they don't know how to produce data in a way that is um, useful or they don't have time to produce it. So I think that's an interesting, interesting thing to think about too. First off, thank you. These are uh, these have been wonderful uh, points to bring up. And I, please don't. I wasn't uh, I wasn't requiring people to have a resource, but these these insights have been very helpful. Um, um, and I hope that as we go forward, as we walk forward through the actually doing some of the more technical type things within R um, and the walkthroughs, that we consider how some of those walkthroughs connect to some of these things. I, I think there's one mentioned in the book, um, I have the book right here, um, for advancing equity, maybe the one of, 
walkthrough three is one that um, is, is explicitly mentioned in the book that um, ties to advancing equity. Um, but again, as we, as we walk through um, the later chapters, you know, let's think back on, you know, what, what uh, consideration um, is engaged, right, in, in this walkthrough. Because um, I think, yeah, I think with some of the insights that you've provided, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a, a wonderful mess that we can, we can kind of deal with together. So um, were there other points, like specific points um, or considerations that somebody working in data science and education should have? Um, I know these, this is quite a few, but what, was there anything else that the authors may have missed or maybe need to be rephrased? I know, Rob, you brought up um, things beyond transparency. It's actually like a systemic intentional thing that we have to do um, in engaging in ethical issues. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Not, then we, I, I think the, the, one of the big things that I got from this section was, um, or that I took home from this was, this is a lot and that we should work together <laughs> to, to, to engage in this, um, to, to engage in these um, considerations within, educa within education. So I really enjoyed the discussion um, tonight. Um, I do have uh, that, that's it for the content. And so just wanted to remind you that next week we're going to be combining chapters five and six, um, getting started with R and R studio and foundational skills. Um, and we'll be jumping into R next week. Um, uh, related to this book, at least I'm sure you're doing a bit of R work otherwise, but, um, uh, so thank you again for, um, your time tonight and, and awesome discussion. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna, I can hang out for a little bit if there's any other questions. So thank you so much. Thanks for leading us, Ryan. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Night. Hey, Ryan, did you say you're going to show me, um, show us the sign up process and how to use GitHub? Yes, um, I can do that. How, how familiar are you with GitHub? I have my account. I use it, but I am in the where <laughs> I get confused if I should fork it or, you know, if, if, if I'm the only user, I can do it myself. It's the confusion when other people are doing and then how, yeah, so that's that's where I get stuck. Totally, yeah. Um, so the, the nice thing about um, what we are requiring people who wanna sign up, um, there's, an e there's an easier way to do it just because you're editing the readme file. Mm -hmm. And so um, let me, again, I have way too many tabs open here, okay. Um, this is this is the one, yeah. So this is the this is the GitHub site, right. right? For our for our book club, um, and this is the README, and we can see here that this is this week. And I think um, Mark said he was signing up for next week, and we're gonna we're gonna end up changing this and kind of doing the dates. But um, what you can do is to sign up for uh, uh, a week, like other folks have. Mm -hmm. You can click on the README file mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you can click on this little pencil here. Yeah, okay. Um, and it'll bring you to the, to the editor. Um, and then you can select a week here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I know that, yeah. I know that uh, Mark's gonna do this, but um, you put your name there. I put, I put them in with the stars just because I saw other people were italicizing their names, you know, whatever formatting doesn't matter. But um, so yeah, you can select a week there. Um, 
if you want to preview changes, you could. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Then a quick yeah quick note. Propose the change, and then there's another there's another um, window or another yeah another screen that like has you confirm something, and so you click another green button that says commit. Mm -hmm. I think it says commit. Um, <clears throat> and there's really nothing you have to do. It's all like every all the branches are connected, all the pulls and pushes are all connected um, when you do it just within the GitHub editor. Um, so all you have to do is press another green button and it'll be sent off to um, the community organizers and they'll be able to then uh, do the final approval. Um, yeah. Cool. So, um, I will come probably every other week, but um, I'll see you, yeah, in two weeks. Okay. Um, and Thank yeah, you. like, I, like yep. I said, I think Isabella and I are going to slightly adjust. Um, yep. You know, we're going to move basically things up a week. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, maybe hold off for 24 hours why we why we click it just yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. well thanks for organizing yes i will wait okay yeah thank you for joining yeah see you bye. soon bye bye